Father God, we come to you and we ask you that your word would go forth and that it would enter into people's ears and into their heart and that it would bring forth fruit, Father God. I pray for your help to preach this truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my sermon today is called A Treasure of Faith. We're going to start in Romans 10, verse 11 through 17, and it says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call upon him. Now he says, Whosoever who believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Or you could say it this way, Whoever call out to him, he will answer. Whoever put their trust and confidence and faith in him, he will lead and guide them. He will help them. Whoever put their delight in him, he will give them the desires of their heart. And he says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is rich over unto all that call upon him. Or you could say it this way, in modern day, there are still the Jews and there's still the Greeks, but it's not, it's not, back then it was, you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. These days, it's just, it's a little bit more, how to say it. People don't think about that more time. They probably think more along the line uh, is, are they saved or they're not saved? Now, there is still, they're still the Hebrew nation, and they still need to come to God. But it's really, you could look at it this way. Were they raised in the church or were they raised in the world? Were they educated or were they a high school dropout? Are they wealthy or are they poor? It, or were they mightily moved of God or they're sitting somewhere crying out to God because they don't know what to do. In other words, it doesn't matter what the outward appearance is, what level their education is, whether they're wealthy or whether they think themselves dumb or whether they think themselves smart. He says, God is rich unto all them that call upon him. What he did in the disciples or what he's done in men and women of God throughout the ages, he will do in you if you call out to him and seek him. He is not a respecter of persons. He's rich to all who call and seek unto him. That's why you can have somebody like Paul, who was a Pharisee. I like to compare it this way. There's the Pharisee, you could call it the modern day churchgoer, who's become a hypocrite. He didn't realize it. He thought he was doing what's right, but he really did not know God like he thought he did. And he even went to the point of persecuting and putting to death the church. Okay, so he was the religious loss. And then you have people who were mass murderers. I don't know the name of the person, but there was this guy who had killed a bunch of people. And in prison, he gave his heart to God and God used him mightily. So you have the, I call it the righteous wicked, and then you call it the wicked wicked. But both people, when they called out to God, God changed their life. And he used them mightily. And that's the same way. He says, if you will call upon him, he will help you. He will deliver you. He will use you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? Those who don't know the God, who don't who know, know the truth, how shall they call on him who they don't even believe exist? And how shall they believe on him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And he says, how shall they preach and accept they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. He says, God says, I have raised up people to go and preach the truth that they might know of me, that they might know my will, that they might know my nature and character, that they may know that I'm there to save them, heal them, and deliver them. Jesus says, I have come to heal the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind, to heal those who are needy, who just to deliver those who are captive. And he says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he says, I have sent people to preach the truth and to where they can keep on hearing the truth and hearing the truth and hearing the truth to where all of a sudden the hard heart has been broken up to where all of a sudden that word takes root in their heart and they can believe. And that can be the same with us. We can be in the church. We could have heard the truth, but we only hear it like on a Sunday morning or something. And then we go out and we do our own thing. And all of a sudden, we don't, even though in our head we know what God says about living righteously, about uh, love and kindness and forgiveness, the nature and character of God, about that we're supposed to be living for eternity instead of the here and now, but we don't really believe it. And it says, so faith cometh by hearing. So we've, what we've got to do is we've got to be kept speaking the word. They says, the word of God is thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And then he says, faith cometh by hearing. So you could say it this way. 
Faith comes by you hearing yourself speak the truth. Now, you can have hear it from other preachers. You can hear it from other things. But if you really want that word to take root in your heart, you've got to speak it. You've got to meditate it on. You've got to continue in it. And all of a sudden, it'll produce fruit. So faith cometh by taking the word and hearing it, listening to it, meditating it, abiding in it, and continuing in it. And it's just like a garden. You plant all the seed that you need. And if something dies, you plant the seed again. And what you do is you keep on watering it. You keep on fertilizing it. You keep on protecting it. And that's what we need to do in our own heart. We take the word and we protect it by saying, Lord, your word is true. And he says, put nothing wicked in front of your eyes. Uh, I hate the works of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. He who soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. So you keep on planting the seed of God in your heart. And then you cut out the rest and you keep on watering it. You keep on crying out to God. You keep on seeking him and to where it brings forth fruit. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and their steel. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither wrath nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what you love, what you desire, what you seek, that is where your heart will be. So we need to have a faith that treasures what God is, his word, his will, to where that is what we seek, that is what we desire, that is what we look after. Because, you know, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to the pearl of great price, uh, to the treasure hidden in the field. And he says, where your treasure is, what you desire, what you long for, what you seek, what you fill yourself, that is where your heart will be. Colossians 3, 1 through 6 says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He says, if you have been saved through Jesus Christ, if you have been raised into the newness of life, seek Jesus. Seek his word. Seek his nature and character. Seek to be right with him, to do what's pleasing in his eyes. Seek to, raise, uh, to reach people for Christ. Seek those things which are of God, which are heavenly, which are above, where Christ sitteth on the ha right hand of God. And earlier we were saying that he will answer you. So if you seek that which is right, if you cry out to him, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. He says, set your affections on things above, not of things of the earth. So you could say it this way, set what you treasure, what you long for, what you seek with all your heart, let it be on Jesus. Let it be on his word. Let it be on his will. He says, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. He says, you are now dead to the world, dead to the sin, dead to the things of this, to this mortal life. And he says, our life is now found in Christ, in faith in Christ, in trusting in Christ, in hoping in Christ, in delighting in Christ. He says, when Christ who has become our treasure, who has become our love, who has become our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. He says, you know, as you see Jesus crucified, then all of a sudden you will love him because he forgave you of your sins. When you see him resurrected, you will see him in newness of life. And that can grow. It can grow in grace. You can grow in peace. You can go in joy. And then the ultimate thing is when you die, and you're in right with God, and all of a sudden you see him, you'll be like him. Or if he returns, you'll see you'll be like him. He says, you will be like, then you shall appear with him in his nature, in his character, and in his truth. He says, because you have this, this wonderful gift, this wonderful mercy and goodness of God, because you have this treasure that he's given you, because of his faithfulness, he says, kill therefore, or put to death therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, relationships before you get married, uncleanness of thought and desires, inordinate affection, affections and loves for things that aren't of God or, or have no value, eternal value, evil conspicuousness or excusing and justifying your sin, and covetousness, which is idolatry, not pursuing money, not pursuing material possessions, not saying that gain is godliness, not finding your life and fulfillment in what you buy and what you own or how you dress. He says this is idol worship. You know, we kind of look at the Old Testament or some people who we consider barbarian and they were 
They were sacrificing their children on altars. They were uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And we're like, man, they're crazy. Why would they like that? But what we don't realize in modern days, we still do the same thing. People go and they get several jobs, not because they, they're in debt or because they need that money, but because they want to afford a better house. They want to afford a better car. They send their kids to daycare. They send them into public schools where they can be raised up in wicked areas and they don't seek God and they don't go to church and they don't raise their kids the way they go all because they are worshiping idols. They're, they don't realize it, but they're sacrificing their lives and their children's lives on the altar of the world. And it's just as destructive now as it was back then. And that's why you say they say 90% of kids who go through public schools, and this was several years ago, and then through a world of college lose their belief in God. And that, it's the same thing. He says, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. He says, God will judge those who don't know him or who disobey his truth, even though they know it's his will. Matthew 6, 22 or 23 says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Like Peter with his eyes on Christ. When his eyes were on Jesus, he was filled with faith. He was filled with trust. He was filled with joy. He was filled with victory. But as soon as his eyes got off onto the world, to the storm that was going around him, all of a sudden he started sinking. But at least Peter had the brains to cry out to God, Jesus, and says, Lord, save me. And that's what we need to be. We need to keep our eyes on Christ. We need to seek him. We need to abide in him. We need to have faith and trust and our delight and our love in him. But if we do get our eyes off Christ, we need to be like Peter who quickly repents and cries out to Christ. And then that's why Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. He had faith, but Jesus was, this is the beginning, Peter. You need to keep your eyes on me. You need to continue to abide in me. You need to grow in grace. You need to grow in peace. You need to grow in faithfulness and joy. You know, it says, it says the kingdom of heaven is like a little grain of a mustard seed. And if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed and you say, go onto this mountain, what Jesus was saying is that if you take a hold of what God says, if you take a hold of his promises and you keep on looking at it and trusting it and watering it and feeding it, and all of a sudden your faith and your trust and your hope in him will grow, and all of a sudden it'll grow and you will have what you say. That's why if you say, Lord, you said that you heal my body, and then you start meditating on his word, you start thanking him for his word, you start uh, looking at other people that God moved on mightily, all of a sudden what you reali don't realize is that you're watering it, you're fertilizing that seed of faith that's in you, and it will grow and produce fruit. And he says, but if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. For if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? He says, therefore, if thine eye is on wickedness or on wrongness, that's why if you look at the news and you see what's going on, all of a sudden you will get angry, you will get fearful, you will get doubtful. All of a sudden, you, all of a sudden your body just almost becomes acidic. You just, it, it really does a number on you. Or if you watch something you shouldn't, all of a sudden you get angry faster, you get bitter faster. Or if you, let's say if the devil points out the fault of your brother or sister, in Christ and if you keep on looking at that all of a sudden you will get angry you will get despairing you will get bitter or it could be you look at your family members and they're messing up and they're not doing God and you you keep on looking at their faults or and all of a sudden you become worried and become fearful like God can you reach him God can you help him or you can even do that same with your life and saying saying Instead of saying, Lord, this sin that's in me is wrong and now I'm looking to you to overcome it, you keep on looking at it. You keep on filling your eyes, your mind, the heart of your own faults. And all of a sudden, you will become filled with that darkness. Now, it warns us even beyond that. It says, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? He says, in other words, if you think you're in the light when you're walking in darkness, he said, great is that darkness because you have deceived yourself. And that's why it says it was to the church of Laodiceans. He says, because you say you are rich and wealthy and have need of nothing, you don't realize you are blind, desolate, naked, and poor. He says, if you don't repent, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's why he says, if you believe that you are right with God, but you are walking in sin and excusing your sin, he says, that is great darkness. And then it goes on to verse 24. It says, no man can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You could say it this way. You cannot keep your eyes on two things. We are meant to have our eyes on one thing. If we, you know, if you are trying to keep your eyes on the road, but you're constantly looking to the left and the right, look at all the different houses, the different cars, the different things on the light, there's a very good chance you're going to have an accident. And it's the same way, he says, you cannot love the world and love Christ because the love of the world will pull you away from Christ. Or, or, or he says, you've got to love Christ and hate that which is wrong, or else, he says, you just can't. You can't be double-minded. You can't give yourself to the world and give yourself to Christ. You are on, it says, you are a double-minded person and you are unstable in all your ways. Then it goes on, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor ye yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not your life more than meat, and your body in raiment? He says, um, he says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you drink. Don't worry about... How, what job you're going to get. Don't worry about your husband or wife to be if you're not married yet. Don't worry about other things. He says, S trust in me, seek me, delight in me. And he says, I will direct your path. I will lead you and guide you just like I do the birds, just like I do the lilies in the valley. He says, I will take care of you. He says, which of you being worried or anxious or stressed out can even cause yourself to grow by one inch? It says in here, cubit. He says, if you can't cause yourself to grow by worrying about it, why are you stressed? Why are you anxious? Why are you seeking the world? He says, and why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do spin. And I say unto you that even Solomon, all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. He, he says, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall ye not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? So when we're worried and stressed out and we're not trusting in God, not having faith in God, he says that the, the faith you have is little, he's saying. You know, Jesus, if you look through the test, oh, New Testament, he was always trying to prove to the disciples and those who were following him, have faith in me. When there was no food, 5,000. When there was no food, 4,000 people. And he fed them with 12 and 7 baskets. And then the disciples says, he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And, he said, and they said, oh, we have no bread. We have no bread. We're in trouble. And Jesus says, what is wrong with you guys? Did you not remember that I fed the 5,000? Do you not remember I fed the 4,000? Uh, when they were saying, um, he, you know, they were trying to cast a demon out of the person. And he says, he says, he says, this one, he says, a lack of faith, he's told him. And he says, this kind of a lack of faith cometh out nothing but by prayer and fasting. He says, this kind of lack of faith, this kind of thinking the problem is bigger, he says, doesn't come out but by seeking me with all your heart to where I can deliver you from that. And he says, so over and over and over again, Jesus was trying to teach them to have faith in God, to trust in God, to look to him, to live their life in him. He says, he, was, he kept on saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood, continue in my word abide in me and I abide in you. He wanted them to, to realize that their life, their hope, their everything was in him and in the Father, that they were supposed to seek him with all their heart, that they were supposed to keep their mind and heart stayed upon him, that they were supposed to delight themselves in him, that they were supposed to give themselves to him completely. And out of that becomes an act of faith and an act of trust to where he can overcome everything. And there's all kinds of weird doctrines, you know, where they, they get you caught up in this area or this area. I even heard one preacher preach a sermon once. It was a lady preacher, actually. She says, this part where he says, oh, Solomon, all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. She said, so God wants to arrayed you in awesome, wonderful, beautiful clothes. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you. To... And that's exactly opposite of what Christ was preaching here. He was saying, give yourself to me. He says, even the most beautiful thing he says, your clothing, your, your, what the material stuff cannot compare to what I made naturally. He says, don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your clothes. Your life is not made up on the things of this world. The things of this world will fade away. They will be stolen. The government will come in and confiscate it. Uh, so your house will burn down. He was just saying the things of this world are temporal, but the things of, etern uh, of heaven are eternal. And he says, 
And it goes on here, and I'll, go, I'll probably get to it shortly. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you need will be added unto you. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or where we shall drink, or what shall we own, or how shall we get wealthy, or how shall we process, wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things to those Gentiles seek, or you say all those things through the world who doesn't know Christ and God seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows what you truly need. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first to be right with God, to trust in Him, to hope in Him, to rejoice in Him, to know and do the will of God, to be like Him and His nature and character. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow. Be worried or anxious not for the things of morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient today is the evil thereof. And then Romans 14, 17 through 18 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not what you're eating. It's not what you're drinking. It's not what you own. But it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's being right with God and walking uprightly before Him. It's being holy as He is holy. It's having His nature and character. It's peace. Being submitted, trusting, believing, having faith in God. And it's joy of rejoicing, a thankful, praising heart in the Holy Ghost. For He that in these things serveth Jesus... Or Christ is acceptable unto God and approved the men. James 1, 13 through 18 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted for God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. He says, when you fail, that's not God's fault. He did not tempt you. He, it wasn't his test for you in the sense of he put that temptation in front of you that's the devil but god might let you go through a time to where he's like he like he took jesus into the wilderness he took the hebrew children through the desert and he says i'm going to show you what's in you i'm going to let you go through a time of struggle but if you have faith in me if you trust in me if you take me at your word then you will have victory that's why you say the hebrew children they went through the wilderness and they were there for 40 years Jesus went in the wilderness and he was there for 40 days. And they say that really what was happening is the original journey through the desert for the Hebrew children was only supposed to last 40 days. That's how long God was going to lead them through there. By the time, supposedly by the time they got to it, it was supposed to be 40 days. But guess what? Because they did not trust in God, because they did not let God deal with their heart, because they always kept on turning back to the world for their fulfillment, back to Egypt, God could not take them into the promised land. And so he says, he took them in the wilderness that they may learn that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Or you could say, he led them through the wilderness that they may learn that there are, what they need is God, what they trust in God, what, that God knows what's best, and that if they love him, if they trust him, if they take him at his word and they base everything they think and say and do based off of what the word says, they would be victorious. And he says, do not err. Do not make a mistake, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variables, neither shadow turning. He says, every righteous thing, every faithful thing, everything of peace, everything of joy, everything that's of the nature and character of God, kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, peace, uh, you know, uh, uh, hope, all this stuff comes from God. He says there is no double-mindedness in God. There's neither shadow of turning. Of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth that we should be the first fruits of his creatures. He says of his own goodness, of his own love, he birthed us with the word of truth. You could say it this, he gave us life in Christ. He gave us life in his word that we might be fruitful that we might have love, kindness, gentleness, goodness, that we might show forth the same nature and character that Jesus did, the same nature and character that God did. And that's why he says we're supposed to be the light and the salt of the world. Jesus came as the light of the world. He came as the salt of the world, and he salted us. He filled us with light to where we may help others, that we may deliver others. He says, so we should be the first fruits of his creatures. And it goes on in the next verse, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. He says, so because you are, you could say it this way, because he says you don't know everything, because he says 
You haven't learned all that I have and all that I am yet. And that's why Paul says, I have not yet apprehended that for which I have apprehended. He says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. He's saying, Lord, I don't want to be a Pharisee anymore. I don't want to, to be wealthy or honorable or known. I don't want the things of this world anymore. He says, I want you, Jesus. He says, I want to seek you. I'm going to live for you. He says, so he says, he says, I have not yet known everything, but he says, therefore, because you are still learning, because you are still growing in me, he says, be quick to hear. If God speaks you, be quick to hear. If somebody corrects you, be quick to hear. He says, slow to speak. Don't be quick to step in. Don't be quick to speak. And we, a lot, I think all of us struggle with being quick to speak when we shouldn't. Slow to wrath. He says, don't get angry quick. You know, surrender it to God. He says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So if somebody does you wrong or you think it does wrong, don't be quick to jump on their case. Probably the best answer is to pray and ask God for wisdom before you open your mouth. And he says, he says, James 1, 21, he says, how, what is, what's the answer? He says, I don't want you to be quick, this the wrath. I don't want you to be quick to speak. He says, I want you to be teachable. I don't want you to try to use your wrath to make people right with God. He says, what are you supposed to do? And he says, wherefore, what, uh, it goes right back to what he said, Jesus said. He says, pull the beam out of your eye. He says, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and even the superfluity of naughtiness. In other words, those things which are obviously wrong, get rid of them. Look to Christ to overcome them, to deliver them. He says, but even those things which are wasteful or useless or have a smattering of that which isn't right. Maybe the way you tease somebody is just a little bit wrong. Maybe it's a little bit flirtatious when you shouldn't be, or maybe it's just a little bit nasty when you shouldn't be, or maybe you're watching something and it leads you astray, or maybe you're wasting your time. And certainly says, lay apart all that which is wrong and even the appearance of evil and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. He says, receive being teachable the word of God hidden in your heart that you might not sin against him, transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He says that he, he will cleanse us and wash us with the washing of water by the word. He says that if we're transformed, we can prove what is the perfect will of God. So he says, receive being teachable the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. And he says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own self. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He says, he says, you need to have the word engrafted in your heart and your mind, and you need to do the word. That's why the Hebrew children, they were supposed to learn that they were supposed to live by the word of God and not by just the possessions they owned. God actually took them to the wilderness to separate them from the world, but to also take them from the worldly possessions to where they would, not re they would realize that God would take care of their needs. They said not one was feeble among their tribe, their clothes, their shoes, nothing wore out in the wilderness. God provided their food, He provided their water, He provided their heat during the night, He provided their light and the shade during the day. He always led them and guide them. And what he was trying to do is get the point across. He says that in Christ you live, move, and have your being. It says the, the rock that followed him was Christ Jesus. So he was trying to teach them that they were supposed to find their life in God and in Christ. And that's what the Bible says. We are surrounded by great cloud of witnesses. We can see what happened in the Old Testament for our benefit to where we may know the will of God. And he says, but he says as he continued, he's, as he's learning the word, but if he doesn't do it, he's like a man who looks in the mirror. He sees what God's will is, but he sees his shortcomings. But then he goes away and forgets what God is, forgets what God's will is, and forgets where he has a problem. And he says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth in there. And he says, whosoever treasureth Christ, whosoever treasureth the word of God, whosoever takes, has faith in God and continueth in Christ, continueth in his word, he, being, he won't be a forgetful hearer, but he'll be a doer of this work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, as you, they say the husbands and wives, sometimes they'll end up looking at each other after decades of living each other. Or if somebody hangs out with a certain group and they'll end up acting like that group. Uh, if you keep on looking at a product or some type of field like a hobby or a sport, all of a sudden you'll become a sports fan or you'll become a shopper, 
or you'll become, let's say you could even just say if somebody who's trying to education, they keep on continuing learning that and all of a sudden they might become a doctor or they might become a lawyer or they might become these things. He says, what you, if you want to become like Christ, if you want to have faith and trust in God, if you want to treasure that which is valuable, he says, you've got to become singly eyed affixed on Jesus. You've got to continue in his word. And he says, all of a sudden, you will be changed into the same image. And it goes on and it actually says that if any man among you seem to be religious, and, but in bride is not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and none defiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the father and widow in their affliction and to keep himself from unspotted from the world. There's a section of scripture that says, as he is, so are we in this world. When he shall appear, then shall we be like him. So he says, if you continue to look on Christ, you will become like him. And he says, if somebody says they're right with God, but they just speak all kinds of things, they speak and they act on, they act things outside of the word of God. If they can't control their lips, he says, they, they don't realize that they're not, they don't know God like they think they do. The religion is vain. He says, what is right with God and what is pure before God is to keep yourself unspotted from the world, to be holy as he is holy and to love your neighbors yourself, to do the will of God, to reach out, to preach the truth, to take care of the widows and the orphans, to visit the people in prison, to visit people in hospitals. And then we'll go on Psalms 119, 165 through 168 says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You could say it this way, Great faith, great truth, great trust have they which treasure Jesus, which treasure the word, and nothing shall cause them to fall. Nothing shall cause them to lose their mind. Nothing shall cause them to lose their hope and their joy. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation. Lord, I have desired, I have longed for, I have looked to be right with you. And he says, and I have kept your word in my heart. I have kept your word in my mind. I follow it. It's precious to me. My soul has kept thy testimonies and I love them exceedingly. He says, I treasure them. I long for them. I delight myself in them. Extremely so, he said. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways are before thee. He says, Lord, he says, I know that you are a righteous judge and you always see what I do. He says, therefore, I have kept your will, your way before me that I may walk up rightly before you because he says, I know you judge righteously. And then he goes, and then he goes on in verse 160. It's actually a little bit before 162 to 163 says, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. He says, I rejoice at thy word. He says, it is precious for me. He says, I, as if I had found some treasure hidden in the field, as if I had found some pearl of great price. He says, your word is precious to me. He says, I hate and abhor lying. I hate that which is false. When the devil whispers in my ear, I hate the lie. When a preacher who preaches something against the word of God, I don't hate the preacher, but I hate that lie and I will not hearken to it. He says, but your word, your truth, what is right, I love. Isaiah 26, 3 through 4 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. You could say, God will keep him in faithfulness and hope and peace and joy, whose mind, whose eyes, whose heart, whose life is in Christ and continues in him because he has faith and trusts him. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Or you can say it this way, have faith in him, trust in him, hope in him, delight in him, take him in his word because he will answer you. He will deliver you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will cause you to have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he will never leave you or forsake you. It says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He says, be, there's a word that says, let the word not depart from my mouth, but meditate on it day and night that thou mayest be able to deserve to do according to all that is written there. And once again, looking at that mirror and continuing in his word, and all of a sudden it becomes reality to you. It becomes meat and drink and it, and it brings forth fruit. And he says, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be strong to speak the word, to meditate on his word, to take me at my word. And he says, have faith and trust me. And then he says, and be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And I'm going to actually end there, actually.
Father God, we come to you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you've been merciful, that you've been good, that you've been kind, that you've helped us, that you led us, that you guide us. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to be like the disciples who finally took you at your word, who finally let that word take a hold of them, and they were used of you, Lord, and they bared forth much fruit. So, Father God, we pray and ask that we would do the same, that we would abide in you and you abide in us, that we would abide in you and your word would abide in us, that we may bring forth much fruit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.